Thank you for that introduction. And on behalf of both Hugo and myself, I'd like to welcome you here to this fabulous spot on the edge of the Ock Hills. We thought this would be a fun way to start our presentation so that we could show you both the stone ball and the landscape context from which it came. So I'll just get the stone ball out of the box. And I won't say much about this. This is just to give you a chance of seeing it because Hugo has plenty to say on this, but, but just to pick out the two main areas of uh, decoration, uh, enigmatic lifelines, if you like. Um, and as I say, Hugo will talk about those uh, in a short while. The second purpose is to show you where this delightful object came from. And if you look over my shoulder on my left, you'll see a small uh, knoll uh, backed by a bit of boggy ground. And during forestry plantation work there in 2017, uh, one of the forestry workers uh, found, found this ball just sticking out of the ground. Uh, and we established that there was a, a sort of Neolithic context there, because when we came back to do field work, we found further objects. Hugo will explain about those. And I think uh, you, you can appreciate uh, from, from, from where I'm standing that this is a fantastic landscape. The broad western panorama over uh, to the mountains around uh, Loch Tay. It's a rich archaeological landscape here. The prehistoric aspects Hugo will talk about, but we, 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 we can note in passing that there's a rich Roman landscape here, a medieval landscape, and a post-medieval landscape. Uh, and just over here we can see a, a ruined steading and another ruined steading just over here. Now, when the ball was found in 2017, it, was, uh, it went through Scottish Treasure Trove and was allocated to Perth Museum and Art Gallery in 2018. And at the end of the talk, I'll come back to that aspect of how we acquired the stone ball. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll now hand you over to Hugo. So Mark set the scene of uh, the discovery of this carved stone ball um, and shown you the site where it, was, where it was actually found. Now, when the ball went into the treasure trove process, it came to me to be uh, examined and reported on. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ball itself and something about the uh, associated artefacts that have been found with it as well. So this... Uh, you can see four images of the carved stone ball up on the slide. Um, you can see it's a sort of it's got six bosses or knobs on the surface of this carved stone ball, and that's one of the most common forms of carved stone ball. Uh, about half of the known examples, so around 225 of them or so, have um, these sort of six knobs arranged symmetrically around the surface of of the ball. It's about a tennis ball size, so it fits neatly in your hand. But what makes this example quite unusual is that it's found at the edge of the normal distribution of carved stone balls. Um, it's, uh, the main concentration is up in Aberdeenshire and immediately in those surrounding counties. And from that area, the distribution rapidly drops off. So by the time we get to Perthshire, there are actually very few. So this is one of only a handful from, uh, from Perthshire. And uh, when we go further south or west, the distribution rapidly falls off. There's only two known from England and uh, a couple from Ireland. So it's a really Scottish sort of thing, predominantly northeast Scotland, that these are found. Now, um, what was really exciting about these finds is that uh, this find in particular is that because it was very promptly reported, um, we were able to go out and actually examine the precise find spot. And we're very grateful for Joseph to uh, taking the time to show us exactly the point where he found this carved stone ball, because that allows us to try and get understand something of the context of this discovery. And that's something that is really important with these particular artefacts, because although there are sort of hundreds of them known, most of them are antiquarian finds. And if we have a parish location, um, we're lucky. So actually being able to understand the, the context of the find is really important and valuable. 
So now you'll have just seen um, this sort of view. Um, the, you can see on the left hand side a sort of view of the fine spot from a distance and you can see it's a sort of quite prominent mound in the, in the local landscape. Um, and on the right you can more clearly see the, the tree planting uh, plough sort of trenches that have uh, revealed this discovery. Now we were really interested in trying to find the archaeological context that this ball was found in and uh, so we went out and we looked at that fine spot we were hoping it would be in an archaeological feature because obviously that would allow us to recover charcoal and the like that might allow us to date this ball directly by those associations. But as it turned out, this ball was basically found at the very base of the topsoil. And you can see how the furrows have basically flipped the, uh, the turves over. And it was, it was found in situ, but at the very base of the subsoil. So it wasn't in an archaeological feature. But as soon as we started looking in this area, what we realised is that um, there were other artefacts um, uh, in, in the topsoil that we could see. So we set about sort of doing a little field walking exercise um, and the black dots you can see on this uh, image here show the location of each individual find, 16 finds in total, and the carved stone ball roughly central to it. So all of the finds which we found were, were basically on the top of that ridge in that area and the carved stone ball at the centre. So it, it means that this artefact, this carved stone ball, is within an artefact scatter. And that's really exciting um, because, as I said, so few have any form of association. So this is valuable new evidence. Now, the artefacts in that scatter are all stone tools. Um, they include sort of flaked flints. There's a very nice uh, flake of uh, agates, which you can see on the far right hand side, beautiful banded stone, not uncommon that is used in uh, around Perthshire, but um, a very nice object all the same. Um, and you can see the orange flint at the top is uh, retouched along the edges and that object is a transverse arrowhead, so a late Neolithic arrowhead. So that's a really important object to be associated with it. We also have number two on the slide which is a scraper obviously a very common hide working tool for near in the neolithic now there are three artifacts at the bottom left of this image those dark uh dark flints at the bottom and they're not flints at all they're pieces of pitchstone um, and pitchstone is found on the isle of Arran, so around 60 miles away to the west and while pitchstone is quite commonly used in that local area throughout prehistory, in the late Neolithic we see it travelling across Scotland and being used uh, in far more distant locations. This seems to be one of those important materials um, that uh, obviously had some significance to have them take it so far. So it might have been used for a very specific uh, activity, but we we don't really know what they're specifically it was used for, but they often made these little micro blades, tiny little narrow blades out of it. Now, the pitch stone itself um, is very uncommon in Perthshire. So there's only 23 artifacts of pitch stone from the whole of, the whole of Perthshire. So this is a significant addition, three pieces. And the fact it's found in a scatter with a carved stone ball does kind of emphasize that this is potentially some uh, important, important location of some kind. Now, the reason having a late Neolithic association with this carved stone ball is quite exciting is that some of the dated examples we have are uh, from late Neolithic sites. So the best dated example we have is from the Ness of Brodka in Orkney. And in 2013, a carved stone ball turned up under the buttress within the main building here, the big building structure 10, which would have been one of the biggest stone built buildings in Neolithic Europe at that time. And when they remodeled it, a carved stone ball was buried beneath one of the buttresses they inserted in the middle of the building. And we know this dates to around 2900 BC. So these objects about 5,000 years old. And similarly, we have dates from um, Scarabray, where several of these were found in the 19th century. And so while we don't have accurate dates for each of the fine spots, we know the phase of activity they were found in is from about 2800 to 2500 BC. So we know these are good late Neolithic artefacts. Now what's really interesting is that 
uh, over time, uh, in the past, the date of these objects has been subject to an awful lot of discussion. And it's only comparatively recently, uh, in the you know, last 50 years, that we had a good idea where they actually sit chronologically. If you look back through the old literature, you'll see all sorts of dates mentioned. Um, Daniel Wilson was one of the first people to talk about carved stone balls, and in 1851, he simply described them as prehistoric. Um, in a more comprehensive catalogue, uh, in 1874, John Smith was convinced that they were Saxon mace heads, and he actually illustrated uh, a section of the Bayer tapestry in his article, uh, which you can see these objects which are being waved around by the Saxons. He was convinced that they were mounted as mace heads, an idea that kind of has stuck, but uh, was convinced that they were brought to Scotland by fleeing Saxons after 1066. Now that didn't hold much water. It was never a very popular um, uh, or really well-grounded theory. And not long after it, Joseph Anderson in his Rhind lectures published as Scotland in Pagan Times, uh, suggested that the objects were in fact uh, uh, Iron Age to early Christian in date. And he drew on another line of evidence. He drew on this, uh, this bronze ball, the Wollstone bronze ball from Lanarkshire, a very small ball, about half the size of, carv of a carved stone ball. And you can see the decoration on that is very much the sort of Celtic style of decoration. And he said that they obviously are from the same tradition. He highlighted the Elgin ball and the Towie ball here and the spiral decorations and said that, there you go, it's a similar parallel. And uh, so proposed that Iron Age to early Christian date. It wasn't entirely accepted, and actually Sir John Evans, who uh, was the expert, the big expert on stone tools at the time, um, argued that they were, in fact, uh, much earlier in date. He argued for a Bronze Age date, and he pointed out the parallels between the spiral designs on the Towie ball and uh, the rock art that was carved onto tombs, passage tombs in Ireland. And at the time, they thought they were Bronze Age. So he had the right associations, but... He hadn't pushed it far enough back in time. So um, there's John Evans, the man himself, uh, with, uh, with his article on carved stone balls, which you'll see the same illustrations crop up again and again. They're reusing Society of Antiquaries of Scotland illustrations through the, a lot of these publications. Now, the uncertainty of this date continued on. Uh, Joseph Anderson, being very influential in Scottish archaeology, um, his views stuck for a long while. And even in the 1930s, we see Gordon Child uh, uh, suggesting that they are uh, quite late in date. And he argued for a Pictish date. He believed Scarabray was a Pictish settlement. And in 1931, he published this illustration of a distribution of Pictish stones against a distribution of carved stone balls. They match, therefore, carved stone balls are Pictish in date. Now, this didn't catch on very, for very long because not long after this, Scarabray was dated to the Neolithic. When um, Stuart Piggott looked at the pottery and assigned it to the later Neolithic uh, Rigno Clacton ware tradition uh, that we see now as grooved ware, um, it, it became clear that these were actually Neolithic artefacts, not uh, Pictish. So you'd have thought that this would have been picked up quite quickly Actually, in archaeological literature, it wasn't until 1951 that someone specifically said that carved stone balls are Neolithic in date. So uh, a very long time where we weren't seeing, uh, seeing, uh, seeing the sort of correct dating of these. And what's more, there are potentially some which are Bronze Age in date as well. And this is a quite interesting aspect one that needs further work, Dorothy Marshall, when she was going through all of the, all of the carved stone balls in Scotland in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, um, she reviewed a lot of the literature and found that amongst sort of Smith's uh, notes which he published, there were associations which sound like some were deposited in Bronze Age context, two from tumuli, um, and another one said to have been found a foot away from, just outside, a short kist, which at the time they knew that was a sort of Bronze Age way uh, of burying the dead. Um, and now we know that, that it's quite frequent that actually objects like 
battle axes are buried outside the kist, not within it. So it could well be that this is a Bronze Age. Uh, this object was deposited in the Bronze Age. So we have certainly Neolithic examples, possibly Bronze Age examples too. Um, one of the best possible Bronze Age examples as well uh, was found uh, our keeling in stripes in Morayshire uh, back in 1890s. And it was found by an antiquarian uh, who was farming his land, digging all the archeology span as he was removing mounds and uh, other such things from his fields. And he discovered a kist with two carved stone balls in. Um, and again, when he published it, it wasn't widely accepted as being uh, a, a genuine report because again, he said it came from a short kist, which everyone suspected was Bronze Age, but they didn't want that date for those objects. And this went on and the National Museum, I'm sorry to say, was actually part of the uh, problem with this particular uh, example in that when the assistant keeper, Frederick Coles, was working on carved stone balls in the, early 90, in the early 20th century, he had direct correspondence with the finder. And there's this wonderful quote from the, the farmer saying that I took the balls out with my own hand. They were lying by the, on the right hand side of the grave where the hands would lie. Even with that first hand account, it was not accepted that that was a, a, a good enough description of that context. And it was discounted. And when this particular object came into the museum in 1928, there is a little note written beside the provenance which said, this has not generally been accepted as correct. Now, having looked through an awful lot of notes in the, uh, our accession registers, that is really exceptional. Um, but when we actually look at the ball itself, you can see that this one is slightly different to most of the Neolithic ones we've seen. See, it's, it seems to be more square than round. Uh, it's, it's sort of like a cube with the corners taken off. And you'll notice how reflective it is on that photograph. It's really highly polished. And all the Neolithic examples tend to have a ground surface and not be polished. So maybe there are some good Bronze Age ones. But I'm going to go back to our, our carved stone ball, which because of our associations with that scatter, because of the form, the decoration, I think this definitely fits in that Neolithic um, tradition. Now, one of the other things we're... I'm very keen on trying to understand with carved stone balls is the way in which they're manufactured, the way in which they're, they're worked over time. Um, and you can see, you know, with this carved stone ball, because it, it came straight out of the ground, it's very fresh, because it was from an area not ploughed uh, extensively in the past, it's in really good condition. And you can really see the patterns of working on it, both under the microscope and by using 3D models, as you can see this sort of shiny metal version, which is the, the carved stone ball with the photographic texture taken off. So when we think about how carved stone balls were made, um, you have to think about the fact that they're making a sphere of stone to start with, and the techniques they're using are, are really techniques they use in everyday life. Lots of pick dressing with a hammer stone, so pecking the surface into a sphere. Probably the most time consuming bit of the whole process is making the ball. Um, that you then turn into um, something with sort of different knobs and discs on the surface. Um, but these techniques are things you, you would be using to make lots of other tools, lots of other stone tools at this period. Um, and so we see the process is often, we see they make the ball, then they grind it smooth, and then they peck out the individual channels. And on this carved stone ball, you can just faintly see traces of where those pock marks are on the surface and they've ground away the surface afterwards to create a nice smooth surface. But there's just little traces that allow us to see how these objects were actually made. So where we look at the 3D model, you might be able to see in the interspaces between the knobs that there's a slightly rougher texture. And it seems that this carved stone ball has been modified after it was manufactured. Uh, originally, it would have had little raised triangular areas between the big round discs. But these have been pecked away at a later date. Um, so this object has changed slightly over time. It's been modified. And then the final thing I was looking at was the decoration. Now the decoration on this, you can see one disc has lattice work of lines. The other one has uh, a series of parallel lines across that surface. Now, microscope, you could see that the lattice decoration 
was done very cleanly, taking a flint tool and just incising a line across the surface. And it's done in one go, really nice and clean cut. Um, and you could tell that they cut the lines along one face in one direction first, and then rotated it and cut all the lines in the other direction. So we can see the sequence in that way that was manufactured. When we look at the, the second face with the parallel lines, we get quite a different picture. Each of those lines has lots of little lines coming off of it. There's, the, it's not been cut in a single line. There's been a very cautious sort of scratching out of the position and then a deepening of that groove over time. And you'll see they're, they're more irregular in the way they follow across that stone. Um, they've not really used the same technique. And this raises an interesting question. Were they executed by the same hand? Did the same person carve these? And I think not. I think that the, the way in which they've produced those lines is so different. Two different people have added those to that stone. And that really raises some interesting questions about how long these uh, objects were um, manufactured and worked over. Here we're seeing an object which has changed slightly over form. It's perhaps been decorated on two different occasions. So potentially by two different people. So maybe we are seeing objects which are, you know, have a long biography. They're things that potentially handed between different people. Different people add to them and shape them and rework them over time. Now, Andy Jones explored this idea uh, recently in his book, Making a Mark, and, you know, proposed that there are sort of these objects are almost in constant flux, being constantly shaped and reworked over time. And sort of, you know, I've put together a sequence of different carved stone balls here, sort of show that idea, moving from the left where you have a, you know, a ball with very shallow working, quite prominent triangular sort of uh, areas in the interspaces moving along to ones where those triangular areas have been pecked away and then the whole design has been deepened and deepened over time. So potentially these objects changed um, within, within a form along that way, but there might be more, some carved stone balls may have had more, far more dramatic changes in shape over time as well. The example on the far left here, you can just see at the edge of this large disc it's begun to be reworked into smaller knobs over the surface. And on this part of the, uh, the, the surface, you can see it's quite extensively reworked. Now, that object is entirely changing its form from one with many big disks to what's one with a ball with lots of small disks, uh, small knobs over the surface. And when we look at others in the museum, like this one in the middle, you can see this line running through the middle of this design. And it appears that potentially there is a trace of an earlier design within what we can now see. So these objects, they have potentially been quite significantly modified over time. The final example on the right is two views of the same carved stone ball. And you can see here that the, uh, it looks like a sort of standard six knob ball from one side one view, but you turn it over and where there should be a disc, you've got a sort of rosette of um, little, little rounded bosses. So that one is quite different. It may well have been reworked, but in this case, it actually appears that as this object was being manufactured, the design just changed and someone chose to do something else on the different side. So it's quite playful here in the forms and how these objects change over time. Now, the big question with carved stone balls is um, what they're actually used for. And you'll have seen that mention early on, right from the 19th century, the idea that their weapons is very popular. So either mounted on a stick used as a mace head or tied with string and either swung or thrown like sort of South American bolas as a sort of weapon. Now, you can see how that might work on some of these objects, but you'll see that some are decorated in those spaces between the knobs. Some are very highly decorated. They don't show a lot of damage. So it's, it's been questioned. Were these more symbolic weapons? And I think, you know, we, it could well be the case that they're more symbols of power and authority, but it could be that they're both, really. We're dealing with objects that potentially had, uh, were used over several hundred years. 
So while something may have started as a weapon, it might have ended up more as a symbolic weapon. If we say, think of, uh, think of mace heads in the medieval period and the mace in the Houses of Parliament, that is far more symbolic. They're, it's based on an object which was a weapon, but it's very much a symbolic object. So the, 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 the way that these objects were deployed over time may well have changed. It's also recently been suggested that these were um, perhaps memory devices. So they were related to, you know, when you hold them in your hand, you want to rotate them. You want to touch the surface. And whether that actually helped you recall the oral history of your society. Um, and something, you know, where you didn't have a written record, that would be a very important thing. So Lynn Kelly has discussed that in a recent book. It seems like a very plausible idea. There's been lots of pragmatic suggestions for these as well, from weights and measures, apprentice pieces, um, suggestions that they're parts of a game or divination tools. There's l numerous options. Um, I don't think we can necessarily pick one option over another. And I think part of the joy of these things is that there are so many possible interpretations of how they're used and their significance to people in the past. So um, I'm going to leave it there. What I am going to say is that, uh, before I hand back to Mark, is that we do have 3D models of this carved stone ball online. You can view it at Sketchfab, on Sketchfab. You can also view um, 3D models of a huge selection of carved stone balls in the National Museum. And also all of the carved stone balls that are in Perth Museum and Art Gallery are also on display too on Sketchfab. So there's some addresses, but if you just pop it in the search, you'll get wonderful examples, such as this, uh, this very highly decorated form um, that, was, that was found in Perthshire uh, to, to look at too. So I'll hand back to Mark. Thank you very much, Hugo. Uh, I'm sure lots of people have questions, but before we dive into questions, I just want to take a couple of minutes to say a few words about the actual acquisition of the ball as it went through Treasure Trove. And as you can see, we're no longer out on the moor, uh, and what we're actually doing first is returning the stone ball to its normal place of display. Uh, where it's been since 2018, when it was allocated to us through Treasure Trove. And in that allocation process, the recipient museum plays a reward uh, to the finder, in this case, as we've already heard, Joseph Shepherd. Acquisitions of museum collections these days, even before COVID, is quite a tricky thing, uh, finding, finding the necessary finance. And this is a, a, an innovative example of how we've tried to raise other kind of funding. We're always able to rely on the National Fund for Acquisitions for up to 50% of any uh, reward fees. But in this instance, we teamed up with the Archaeology and History section of the Perth Society for Natural Sciences, and they led on our behalf uh, a crowdfunding campaign uh, through Just Giving Online, which raised uh, the other 50%, nearly £1,600 uh, of the cost. And that was a new departure for us, a new departure for the PSNS, who are a body we've worked with for over 100 years. And so we, it, it all worked really well. Within a three-month period, 16 donors had provided the necessary money, mostly local donors, but there was a donor from New Zealand, and I just want to say once more thank you to the PSNS for supporting us in that way. And we're looking forward to kind of refining that process and, and collaborating in the future. Okay. Just top the case on. And that concludes the presentation from Hugo and I. Thank you very much for listening.